this morning. Uh, how many of you have been practicing being a joyful person this week? Any of you? Right on. Um, well, you know, this is, I'm convinced that on a Sunday morning, there's no better place to be than in the house of the Lord, worshiping together. And uh, it is just uh, a joy for all of us. And so we're really glad you're here this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about grace. As you just heard in the prelude, we sing Amazing Grace uh, many times throughout the year. But what is grace? What does it mean that we walk in grace? We're going to be devoting the next several weeks to looking at this topic of grace and the impact that grace can have on our lives. Uh, and so, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us, and we recognize that this day is a gift that you've given to each one of us. So we pray that even as we worship you this morning, that we would have a deeper sense of who you are and who we are as followers of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we worship the Lord this morning?
Gracious and loving God, we come to this place this morning with the joy to celebrate who you are and who we are because of you. By your grace, you receive us, forgive us, and empower us, and change us into the likeness of your son, Jesus. And continue to transform our lives into the likeness of Christ. Teach us how to live and love in such a way that we can honor the unity of our faith, which is a place where love and grace rule our hearts. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. May be seated. I want to invite the uh, fathers to come up, Michael and Mary. And uh, I think uh, Ryan and Brooke Robbins, uh, are, are you here? They're here. They're, they're going to be here. Do you ever feel like they're on the spot? <laughs> we, have, we have a couple of couples uh, joining today, and we have a few couples joining next week, um, and it's just a joy to celebrate new members in the life of the church, because what that means is that God is bringing people into our midst to go on this journey with us along the way as we all follow Christ, and we are so thankful. Uh, Michael and Meredith, that God has brought you here and that he's led you to this point uh, where you want to become members. And so um, we, uh, we join the tradition of the church as I ask you questions. And um, we talk about these questions during the, uh, during the new member class. Um, and basically, the questions engage us at a level where we recognize, well, this is where we're going to plug in, you know, to live out our, our faith life together. And so, uh, I ask you today, uh, is it your desire to turn away from things that are evil and turn toward God, if so say it is? And God wants to give you freedom and power to resist evil and injustice in whatever form it would present itself. If you receive that power, so we do, have you trusted Jesus Christ for your own salvation and rely on His grace daily uh, to live that out, if so say we do? All right. So will you, by a few of your prayers, praying for the church as often as you can, your presence, being here as often as you can, your gifts, um, giving it to the Lord's ministry through your resources, your time, your talents, your presence, your, your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, using the gift gifts that God's giving you, serving ministry, and your witness. Bearing witness to what God's doing in your life. If you will um, give to the Lord's ministry in each of those ways, say, with God's help, we will. Now, um, this is really an opportunity to remember um, our call as followers of Christ. So if you all would reaffirm both your rejection of sin and your commitment to Christ, say, we do. We do. And will you now receive Michael and Meredith Father into your love and care? Will you surround them with a community of faith so that you can encourage them in their life together? If so, say, with God's help, we will. All right, let's pray for this too. Gracious God, we thank you so much for Michael and Meredith and their son Chase. Lord, we pray your blessing to be upon them. That they would continue to walk in the way of Christ. That even as they come among us here today, Lord, that we would surround them with a community of love. That we would walk together, encourage one another, and help each other grow along the way as we commit our lives to following Christ. God, would you pour out your blessing upon Michael and Mary and Jesus, that they would continue to walk in your favor all the days of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you welcome your new brother and sister in Christ?
scripture reading from the Old Testament this morning comes from Judges 16, verses 13 through 22. Then Delilah said to Samson, Until you have mocked me and told me lies, tell me how you could be bound. He said to her, If you leave seven locks of my head with the web and make it tight with a pin, then I shall become weak and be like everyone else. So while he slept, Delilah took the seven locks of his head and wove them into a web and made them tight with a pin. Then she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pin, the loom, and the web. Then she said to him, How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me three times now, and have not told me what makes your strength so great. Finally, after she had nagged him with her words day after day, and pestered him, he was tired to death. So he told her his whole secret and said to her, A razor has never come upon my head, for I am a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, then my strength would leave me. I would become weak and, uh, and like everyone else. When Delilah realized that he had told her his whole secret, she sent and called the lords of the Philistines, saying, This time come up, for he has told me his whole secret. When the lords of the Philistine came up to her and brought the money in their hands, she let him fall asleep in her lap. She called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. He began to weaken and his strength left him. Then she said, The Philistines are upon us, Samson. When he awoke from his sleep, he thought, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. So the Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes. They brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles. And he ground at the mill in the prison. But the hair of his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. Our reading from the New Testament comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 10. Even considering the exceptional character of the revelations, therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn has given me in the flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. To keep me from being too elated, Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Let's sing together in response to this word, um, the third stanza of Come Thou Found.
And if you would sign that up yourself and those who are with you today, when the offering comes by after the message, you can just drop that uh, in the offering later. Uh, also in your bulletin, there are a list of all the announcements of things that are going on in the life of the church, and we hope you will take some time to look through there uh, to see the, the many things that are going on. One thing that's not in there is that this afternoon, uh, the Sapis is putting on uh, a walk a mile in her shoes at Warren Park. And uh, for a donation of $30, uh, you can walk a mile around Warren Park uh, and support the, the great work that Sapis is doing. Um, and so the sign-in begins at 1 p.m., the walk begins at 2 p.m. Uh, if you'd like to be part of that, I'll invite you to do that. Uh, also, in your bulletin, some of the things that you'll find, uh, there's many opportunities to grow spiritually in the context of groups, small groups in particular. Um, Joyce Chase uh, is, uh, had, is leading one on a Wednesday morning, and that's kicking back up. And you can find out the, the times on that in your bulletin. And also on, on Thursday mornings at 7 o'clock, we've got a men's group that meets in the parlor, and, and I'm, I'm facilitating that. So uh, if you're at a point in your life where uh, you're, you're ready for a little small group experience, just a chance to grow uh, in the Lord some more, it's a great opportunity for you to do that. Uh, also, we been looking at the ASP rubbish sale. Uh, you know, we have a rubbish sale. I know you have one every year to support the work uh, as the youth go down to the ASP. And so you can find out how to, where to bring your stuff, how to bring your stuff, when to bring your stuff. Um, and we appreciate that so much because it does so much good. Well, those are all the announcements uh, that I have. So, uh, as always, would you please be praying for the things that are going on uh, in Charleston Wesley? The ministries that are happening, um, would you be praying for uh, what God is doing in and through us, that God would continue to work and transform lives uh, for the sake of Christ? Let's come before the Lord. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day that you've given us, and we thank you for the opportunity to gather together as your people. Lord, we sing of amazing grace, and it's your grace that has been extended to us through Christ. It is your grace that was evidenced by the fact that while we were still sinners, you died for us. That is grace. Lord, your grace is given to us to empower us, not to excuse us. So God, today, as we encounter your grace, we pray that you would empower us to continue to follow Jesus Christ. Lord, we do pray for Charleston Wesley United Methodist Church and its many ministries. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to whisper your still small voice to our inner person. Lead us to lead others. God, we pray for all the things that are going on and ask that you would empower them with your spirit to be a blessing to others in the way that you've blessed us. God, we see a hurting world all around us. And it's not just all the way around the world. It's not just with the persecuted Christians that, um, that are experiencing such persecution all around the world today. It's not just the evil that we see in the Holy Land, the Middle East, and in Europe, and even in the United States. It's not just in the, the senseless acts of violence that, uh, that are constant on the news. Even in our communities, Lord, we're surrounded by people every day who are hurting. And so we pray that you would empower us to be a light in the dark world to be a blessing to those around us. Stir in our hearts today, Lord. Draw us close to yourself so that your grace would change us into the likeness of Christ who himself taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory of the world. Amen. Finally, invite our young friends to come forward as we 
sing All Things Bright and Beautiful, the first stanza. Still buy. I mean, he kind of looks yucky right here. 
experience of a man who was a slave trader, but because of God's grace, experienced an incredible change of heart. That man, John Newton, eventually left the slave trading world and was ordained as a minister at the age of 40. How does that happen? How does a man so lost, a man on such a wrong path, end up on the right path with a completely changed life? How does that happen? It happens by grace. And we're starting a new series today called Graceology, a study of a second chance. You see, the topic of grace is an important one. It's a word that many of us, if you've been around the church for any length of time, it may be a word that you throw around rather loosely. It's a word that we learn early on, especially in the United Methodist Church. We, we understand grace. We, we are grateful for grace. We understand that it's all about God's grace, and we throw that word around. But as followers of Christ, as people who minister to others in Christ's name, we probably ought to have a good sense of what it is. Right? Have you ever experienced that? You've been around the word so long, but have you ever unpacked the word? Have you ever, um, you know, have you ever dived deep into the meaning of a word that we use so often in the church? Grace is a great one to explore. The Bible says in Titus 2.11, it is by grace that we are saved. In Hebrews chapter 4, we find that we can approach God's throne of grace in order to find grace. In 2 Corinthians, as you heard read earlier, the Apostle Paul, going through a very difficult time. And what does God say to Paul? Paul wants God to take this bad situation away, and God says, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul. In Romans 5, we learn that we have obtained access to grace, in which we stand through Christ. So we say that God gives it, we need it, we can receive it, and that in Christ, we are in grace. But what is it? What does it mean? If, if one of your friends came up to you and said, would you explain to me God's grace? What do you tell them? Where do you begin? C.S. Lewis, a uh, the great theologian and author, was once at Oxford University. And he walked into a room filled with theologians and philosophers, and they were talking about Christianity. And Lewis asked, well, what is the question that's out on the floor right now? And they responded, well, here's our question. What is so unique about Christianity? C.S. Lewis said, well, that's easy. It's grace. No other world religion has grace. Other religions are based on doing stuff in order to earn your way to God. But Christianity is about God's free gift of forgiveness and eternal life. C.S. Lewis said, grace is the centerpiece of Christianity. So what is this thing that is the centerpiece of Christianity that we call grace? Well, one definition is this. Grace is the favor of God shown to sinners. This is maybe the simplest way to put it. Grace is the favor shown by God to sinners. Now you can elaborate on that, right? You can say that grace is the free gift of God. It is the unearned, unmerited, undeserved favor of God for sure. But for the most part, grace is the favor of God shown to those that don't deserve it. Right? <clears throat> when Jesus talked about grace... Jesus didn't write some academic treatise with, filled with footnotes, right, for us. He told a story. And if you were here last week and heard my father-in-law speak about joy, he referenced the story in Luke 15. 
the story of the prodigal son. It is a story of grace. And this week we're looking at another story. And guess what we're going to find in this story? Say it. Oh, you guys are with me. I love it. All right. It's another story of grace. But it may not be one that you attribute to grace. Because it's the story of Samson. You remember the story of Samson? Growing up, this is this like Hercules meets Lou Ferrigno meets Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, meets the Terminator uh, in the Bible. It's this awesome story of power and strength. You can read about it in Judges 13 to 16, and if you went to the website this past Wednesday or Thursday, and you read that little section of how to prepare for the weekend, maybe you read Judges 13 through 16 to get ready for today. If you didn't, a great homework assignment, because this is a fabulous story. We're in the book of Judges. Judges isn't so much about guys in black robes and gavels, uh, but those who provided leadership to Israel. In Wesley's words, uh, the judges avenged Israel of their enemies. God was using this period of judges before they had kings to rule over them. God was using this period of judges um, to help Israel be free now that they're in the promised land. And so you have two major players. It's the Israelites and the Philistines. These guys were deep enemies. It was a rivalry like no other. I mean, this we're talking... Chicago Bears, Green Bay Packers. <laughs> Chicago Cubs, St. Louis Cardinal. We're talking a rivalry between Israel and the Philistines. And so God is going to bring about deliverance for the people of Israel against the Philistines. And so God comes to uh, Manoah and his wife. This couple, Manoah and his wife, they've been barren for years. They haven't been able to have any children. But they've been visited by an angel. And in Judges 13, um, take notice of the fact that the birth of their child is going to be a miracle. God has specific plans for this child. He's going to be a Nazarite. Now, the Nazarite meant that they, that word Nazarite literally means consecrated, set apart for use by God. Many people um, in this time period would enter into a Nazarite vow for a week or two weeks, or a month even. But Samson was dedicated from birth to live as a Nazarite his entire life. There were some restrictions to being a Nazarite. There were some rules that went along with it. Samson is the only one whose life is marked by this. I mean, no pressure, right? This is like kind of naming your child, I'll save the world from hunger. Right? I mean, how do you live up to? I'm going to deliver Israel from the building. A little bit of pressure. But we learned something that's very special about Samson. When the Spirit of God would move upon Samson, he would become freakishly strong. And as long as he kept his battles, as long as he followed the rules, as long as he kept his hair, the Holy Spirit, at a time that the Holy Spirit would decide, the Holy Spirit would dump like spiritual red bull into Samson, into his body, and into his spirit. Now, if, if we were to stop at this point, you would say, good night. What potential, right? Here you have a man set apart from birth to be used by God miraculously. And you would think, what potential? Set apart by God, divine call, empowered by God. But as that author Charles Gillette says, everybody's got the potential for great good and great wrong in them. It's the choices we make that define who we really are. And what we discover is that Samson begins to make very poor choices. This is, describes us to some degree, doesn't it? We all resonate with that, don't we? We look back over our lives and we think, wow, we had some potential in this area or that area. And maybe we made some choices that took us away from that potential. I don't know what your experience is. 
But my guess is, if you're like me, you can look back on your life and you can say, hmm, I probably didn't capitalize on that. No parent looks at their newborn baby and says, oh, what a failure. <laughs> right? When we look at our children, we see massive potential. We see doctors and lawyers and point guards. And we see all the potential that lies in this little baby. Quick. I would guess that Manoa and his wife saw the same potential as a little child. But as Samson got older, he made some choices that took him away from God's plan. He goes to Timna and he sees this Philistine woman. It says that he looked at her and said, she's right for me. In the Hebrew, it literally translates to, she is so fine. <laughs> and he tells his parents, I want that woman. Make her my wife. Mom and Dad, I don't know, maybe you've had some kids that have been demanding over the years. Samson's doing the same thing. Mom and Dad, make this Philistine woman my wife. So he's going back down to Timna, he's this time to take him on the dad. He's either behind them or in front of them. And then a lion rushes upon him. And it says that as this lion came at Samson, the Spirit of the Lord came over him. And he rips this lion apart and leaves it for them. Later, he's coming back and he's going to go visit again. And he looks down and he sees the carcass of the lion. And some bees had come along and they had made a little hive in the carcass of the lion. And in Winnie the Pooh fashion, it says that Samson just kind of dips out some honey and he starts eating it on his way to visit his honey in... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Bad pun. Uh, to visit his girlfriend in Timna. Things go south from there. And the wedding goes bad. He has a little, uh, he wants to have a riddle, put out a riddle to the guys that are there. The guys that have the riddle, they can't answer it. And so they get Samson's wife to get the answer. Samson goes ballistic. He ends up killing a thousand Philistines. And then, at this point, you can almost say Samson's not only not living up to his potential, he's living against his potential at this point. <coughs> He's just, he has all these times where he's moving away from his Nazarite vows. And yet, God seems to be using Samson despite his brokenness. Enter Delilah, whose name means flirtatious, by the way. Delilah is, she invites Samson, and she wants Samson to tell her the secret of his strength. And he starts toying with her with all these different possibilities that aren't true. He's lying to her and saying, yeah, if you do this, I'll be as weak as any other man. And then she's like, Samson, the first things are upon you. He breaks through the things. You know, at one point it says in, in one translation, if you tie me with seven thongs, which is not, there's, there's, there's no correlation there. Uh, that literally meant like a bowstring, okay, not a flip-flop or anything else. Um, and a bowstring. He said, if you tie him with some bowstring, I'll be as any other man. Samson, the Philistines are upon him. He breaks loose and he destroys the Philistines. Little by little, if you watch the story, he gets a little bit closer to the truth. And finally, he tells Delilah, if you cut my hair, I'll be weak. And they cut his hair. Samson gave up God's secret for Victoria's secret. <laughs> what causes a man to do that? Right? Think of that. God had given him a secret that he would carry all the life. That he would have power to do what God had called him to do. But so easily he walked away from it. And as a result, the Philistines captured him and gouged out his eyes. It's a very sad ending to the story. Samson gave all of his potential away. Have you ever been there? A stage in life had so much potential. But one thing led to another. One choice led to another. You look back and you, you 
think if I won it. I blew it relationally or professionally. Or maybe you can even say you've blown it spiritually. I know I have. So what does Samson, the story of Samson, have to say to us? One of the most powerful scriptures to me in all of the Bible is Judges chapter 16, verse 22. But the hair on Samson's head began to grow again right after it had been shaved. Do you sense the grain? Samson had given away his whole secret and they shaved his head and he didn't even know that the Spirit of God had departed him when he stood up to take care of the Philistine. God left him. But the hair on his head began to grow. The symbol of God's presence began to grow again. And God would ultimately use Samson to fulfill his destiny. This doesn't mean that the consequences of our actions don't go away. They don't go away. It doesn't mean everything goes back to normal after we blow it. It just means that God restores broken lives. God never gives up on you, even if you have given up on God. And maybe some of you need to hear that today. There's a story that we struggle uh, was a, a self-avowed atheist and he set out to prove that Jesus uh, was false, not the Son of God. And uh, in, his, in his attempt to prove uh, that Jesus was false, uh, he discovered in fact that the, the evidence is overwhelming and he gave his heart to Christ and, and his life had been forever changed. He just released a book called The Case for Grace. Uh, his first book was The Case for Christ. And in the case for Grace, he tells the story of a, of a woman named Stephanie. Stephanie's story is an amazing one. Uh, she was born at the end of the Korean War. Her mother became pregnant. It was a biracial uh, pregnancy, and biracial babies were not received in the Korean culture. Her hair was curlier. Her eyes were different. Her skin color was different. Uh, children like this during the Korean conflict were treated as less than human. And, and this little girl's mother was raising her until she was four years old. And then the mother met a man, a Korean man, and she wanted to get married. But he wanted nothing to do with that little four-year-old. And so they, as a couple, abandoned their little four-year-old. This was very common. Many times mothers would kill their little babies. Uh, if they were biracial because of how they would be treated in their culture. At that point, this little four-year-old girl found herself in an environment that was predisposed to hate and to hurt. People would call her terrible names, ugly names. In Vietnam, the same principle had the same kind of thing happen. They called them Uyghur, the dust of life. In Korea, they called them Tucky which meant alien devil. Horrific. She went through everything that you can imagine of someone who was despised and treated like her. An epidemic of cholera hit, and at one point, this little four-year-old crawls up on a garbage heap to die. But there was a Swedish nurse who was a missionary who was walking around looking for babies to take to an orphanage. And this, this Swedish woman saw this four-year-old and she thought, I could take her, but if I knew parents won't adopt a four-year-old, they'll adopt a baby perhaps, but not a four-year-old. And she started to walk away and the nurse describes that her legs felt like they were filled with lead. She couldn't move and she heard in her own native Swedish tongue that child was mine. So she turns around, picks up the baby, takes it to an orphanage. The girl was nursed back to some level of health and soon helped the women of the orphanage clean the little babies up when parents would come in to look over the babies for adoption. And one day, a couple walked in and this couple saw this little girl 
off in the corner, the man looks so good. They're looking at the little babies, and this little boy can help, you know, get the little boys all dressed up for this couple. But the man looked over and saw this four-year-old girl. And he walked over. And she, she was describing to Lee Strobel, my hair had so much lice in it, it looked white. One of my eyes was a, a lazy eye it, because of the malnutrition. But this man walked up and he cradled my face in his hand, his enormous hand. She said, I had never been loved like that before and I didn't know how to receive that love. And so you know what she did? She took his hand, she threw it away, and she spit on him. And she ran and she hid in a closet. She didn't know how to receive that kind of love. Can you imagine? The one act of a person that is so loving, so grace-filled, is re responded to by being spat upon. Now, I don't know about you, but the question that arises within me before I pass judgment on this little girl is, Bob, haven't you ever done that with God? Haven't there been times in your life when God's poured out His grace and maybe you didn't spit in His face, but you turned your back and you went another direction? That young couple adopted that little girl. She grew up in Indiana. They nursed her back to health. Today she lives in Oregon. She's married to a man who's a former missionary. And she has a ministry of telling young girls, many of whom don't have fathers and some of whom have abusive fathers, she tells them of God's grace. The God of grace wants to adopt you and forgive you and transform you. Samson had a call in his life. And even though he disregarded much of it, God was able at the end to fulfill Samson's destiny and accomplish what God started out at Samson's birth. Maybe you just need a second chance today. Maybe you're at a point where you feel like you've blown it physically, spiritually, relationally, and you need a second chance. I'm here to tell you that God looks at you and He sees someone very beautiful with enormous potential and He is willing to receive you, forgive you, restore you, and use you for the building up of His kingdom on this earth. Let's pray. Gracious God, We all need a second chance. Only you know, Lord, those areas of our lives that are perhaps forever gone because of decisions we've made. But Lord, don't let us stop there. You are a God of second chances. And with you, all things are possible. We thank you for the story of Samson and how his life points us to another miracle birth. One who would ultimately keep all of his vows. Who is strong to save. Whose name is Jesus. We thank you for that love. In Christ's name. I want to invite the ushers to prepare to receive the morning offering. Uh, because when we bring our tithes and our gifts and our offerings, this and this only makes ministry happen in the context of this church. So as you bring these gifts with gratitude in your heart, may they be used for the further of God's kingdom.
gifts that you've given to us. And we want to be faithful to you. And so we bring you these gifts and pray that they would be used for the furthering of your kingdom on this earth. Empower and equip the ministries of this church with these gifts that others would come to know the same grace that we have come to know through Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Can we close by singing the first and second stanza of a marvelous hymn?